Oh, thank you, and uh, thanks for coming along, and thanks to EWB uh, for inviting me along today. Um, must admit, it's a few years since I've read the book. Uh, <laughs> so it's nice to be reminded of that point. Uh, so I thought, what better place to start? Um, I don't use PowerPoint. I feel that power corrupts, and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. <laughs> um, <laughs> what that means is I just make stuff up for a while and then sit down when it's on time. So, uh, so why not start with time? Um, absolutely. In the 1970s, the, res the last resource boom that Australia had, uh, the, the culmination of that boom led to an investigation of how Australians would enter the 21st century uh, living with such abundance, with steady productivity growth and income <coughs> growth, how were we to cope with all of our leisure time? Now, on reflection, it was a very simple and obvious uh, question to ask at the time. Because the history of the 20th century was the history of leisure. We started the 20th century, as in Australia started the 20th century, with employees having no paid holidays, no public holidays, so no annual leave, no, pu no paid public holidays, usually working 10 to 12 hours a day, usually working six or six and a half days a week. 109 years ago, that's what Australia looked like. And throughout the 20th century, we moved steadily post-World War I to one week's paid annual holidays for full-time workers, then two weeks, then three weeks, then four weeks. There were fights over eight-hour day. I don't know if you guys have even heard of eight-hour day. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that used to be an aspiration, an aspiration which we've subsequently abandoned. But uh, the, throughout the 20th century, we moved to you know, one week, two weeks, three weeks, to the, the culmination, the pinnacle, the right number of four weeks annual leave. And you realise why we have four weeks annual leave, don't you? It's the right amount. Well, <laughs> it's got to be. Why is four weeks the right amount? Well, because it's how many we've got. <laughs> Germans have got six. Poms have got five. Swedes have got nearly seven. European average is five and a half. We've got four. Why do we have four? Because after we got four, we stopped asking for more. When did this happen? In the middle, in the early 1970s. We moved to four weeks leave at the peak of the last resources boom and basically for the last 30 years Australians have started to work longer and longer hours. We've worked for more and more weeks. We've increasingly casualised our workforce so that the number of people with access to things like sick days and holidays has actually declined and the, the length of working time has actually increased. So we spent the first three quarters of the 20th century using our wealth to buy leisure time, and we've spent the last 30 years uh, of, uh, of first, the last 30 years of Australia's history buying stuff. And I'll talk about stuff a bit later. But that was not the singular goal for the first three quarters of the last century. Now, I don't know if you heard about this, but uh, I didn't really introduce myself too well. But so the Australia Institute's is think tank in Canberra. Uh, we do policy stuff, I'll talk a bit about it today, but last week we had a bit of fun and declared last Wednesday to be National Go Home on Time Day. Uh, Anyone hear about it? Yes. Yeah, good. Well, that's what we do. Um, <laughs> um, and why did we declare National Go Home on Time Day? Well, because Australians on average work 44 hours a week. The OECD average is 39. Five hours a week, Pff, that's not so much. Well, it's actually 10%, more than 10% of an average work week. Now, if employers underpaid you by 10%, you'd probably notice. But luckily, we're so sort of keen to get ahead that we donate 10% of our work time back to our employers in the form of unpaid overtime. Collectively, that means about $70 billion worth of time. Or more importantly, I think, we work the equivalent of six weeks, six full-time weeks, in unpaid overtime each year when we only have four weeks paid leave. Why? Well, I don't know. You must do it. Someone must do it. But presumably it's because we feel that we're not happy with where we're at. We're busy. We need more, 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 more. We have to work harder and harder and harder and harder. I'm not blaming individuals. I'm saying this is the society that we've created for ourselves. This is the result of all of the productivity increases 
of all the wonderful new technologies we've got. Productivity is units of output divided by units of input. To become more productive means to do more with less. By definition, working longer hours is the opposite of productivity. Why? Because that's increasing output by increasing inputs. Throughout the first three quarters of the 20th, 20th, 20th century, we were becoming much more productive in the sense that we were producing more and more stuff while working less and less time. But for the last 30 years, we've produced more and more stuff, but we've done it by working longer and harder. So the economic miracle that we describe is not so miraculous when you realise that the way that we're making more stuff is by working harder and by working longer. Again, not judging individuals and the choices they make about their workout. I don't care what you do. I'm describing society. I'm not describing individual choices. But come back to it, what <coughs> is the point? Why is it in the 70s we thought we would continue on that downward trend? What was the motivator to turn it around? Well, that's one of the things that I want to talk about today. So time is a really important part of affluenza. Now I want to talk about money. Australia today, GDP, gross domestic product, total amount of stuff that we produce. It's just stuff, okay? There's all sorts of different stuff. I don't care which stuff you like to buy, but you add it all up and you get GDP, gross domestic product. And gross domestic product today is about twice as big as it was 20 years ago. Okay, when GDP grows at 3.5% per year, it doubles about every 20 years. So who here is over 20? All right, good. I get freaked out. The answer to that question is not always so good. Um, <laughs> not saying you don't look young and fresh, but... Um, <laughs> so Australia is twice as rich as it was when you were born. If you're 40, it's four times as rich. And by rich, I mean total amount of stuff. Right, the market value of all the stuff that we can go out and buy. Now, 20 years ago, 1989, not that long ago really, we've doubled GDP since then. Now, as a society, we often, uh, you know, we often talk about the problems we face. Well, before we talk about the problems, I want to talk about the strengths. Let's make it more recent. In the last five years, we've solved the shortage of mobile phones with video cameras. <laughs> we've tackled it. Give yourselves a pat on the back. I mean, five years ago, there was a crisis. Do you remember it? Yeah. Do you remember the front page of the paper saying Australia identifies huge gap in mobile phones with video cameras built in? And we said, right, let's mobilise the collective effort. We must <laughs> tackle this problem. All right, well, give yourselves a pat on the back because we've done it. And we've nearly solved the shortage. All right, we've almost completely wiped out the blight of television sets that are curved. <laughs> All right, remember them? Again, well done, Australia. We've nailed it. Sorry, Indigenous Health. We, you're, you're a crisis and a priority, Indigenous health. We all know that as Australians, it's un-Australian that the gap in life expectancy, the gap in educational attainment, the gap, it's a crisis. We'd love to help, but you see, there's no money. It's a priority. I mean, find me a politician that doesn't agree that tackling Indigenous disadvantage is a priority. What they mean is it's a priority right after we sort through the important stuff like the shortage of those cameras with the phones, those embarrassing curved television sets, the MP7 player or whatever we're up to now. <laughs> okay, right after we deal with all that, then maybe, 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 if, if, if they sit up straight and are well behaved enough, then maybe we'll do something about Indigenous disadvantage. Last week, maybe it was the week before, but not that long ago, the, uh, the, the Assistant Climate Change Minister, I don't know if you know we've got one, uh, but we do, uh, Greg Combay, announced that there was this giant problem uh, that we're going to have to mobilise Australia's 
and I'm paraphrasing, but this will be close, we have to mobilise Australia's economic, manufacturing and industrial base <coughs> to solve this huge problem. This huge problem that's going to cost tens of billions of dollars. It's going to require concerted and coordinated effort on a scale and of a complexity not seen in Australia before. Does anyone know what problem he was talking about? That's right, the submarines. Okay, we're going to build 12 new submarines. And to do it is going to cost tens of billions of dollars and it's going to be so big and complex that we need to really rethink whole segments of the Australian economy if we're going to do this. Now, of course, we know that the reason we can't tackle climate change is it'll be a bit expensive. And we also know that in Australia, with politics being what it is, we can't tackle problems like climate change because the problem is the costs are up front. All right, but the benefits are uncertain in the future. And we're not smart enough, the politicians tell us. We're not smart enough to deal with problems where the costs are up front, the payback is both distant and uncertain. But I'm not sure that we ever got around to using the old submarines. <laughs> we seem to be willing to spend tens of billions of dollars to build replacements for things that we didn't use because we're worried that in the future we might <coughs> need them. So I don't understand why if the problem, if the economic problem of tackling climate change is that we can't afford it, allegedly, and the political problem of tackling climate change is as a democracy we're not good at making decisions where the costs are up front and the benefits are distant and uncertain, I put it to you that the ambitious rhetoric combined with the very ambitious checks that we write to buy uh, submarines and fighter planes suggests that Australia is perfectly capable of affording to solve certain problems and is democratically sophisticated enough to deal with the politics of deferred gratification. It just seems that when it comes to issues like indigenous disadvantage or climate change, somehow the rules are just a little bit different. So when it comes to, so I'll, I'm sort of going to get to trade in a minute and then I'll tie it all together and we'll have a bit of time for questions. But the point that I'm trying to make is as a society, we're all very busy. Okay? You may or may not be. Keep, the reason I sound sort of so uh, determined to separate <coughs> you from the statistics is I don't know you as individuals. I don't, I'm not trying to judge individuals according to the decisions they've made. I really don't care. But I do think it's important to reflect on the Australia that we've constructed for ourselves. And the Australia we've constructed for ourselves works hard. It works longer than previous generations not just longer in terms of hours of work, but longer in terms of weeks of work in a, in a year and longer in terms of years of work in terms of a career. That's fine. We can do whatever we want. We're all big kids. But what's driving that? So there's time, money. Well, money is all about the fact that obviously we've doubled our income in the last 20 years and it's not enough. How do I know it's not enough? Well, A, because people seem to work those long hours, and B, because we know that the reason we can't tackle climate change or indigenous disadvantage is there's not enough money yet. So it's obvious when you think about it that if we work hard for another 20 years and double GDP again, it's obvious that we'll help indigenous people second time round, isn't it? Like, it's, it's sort of, it's a lay down misere, it's inevitable. There's no doubt that even though in the last 20 years when we doubled GDP, there didn't seem to be enough left over, there's no doubt if we just repeat the experiment, the obvious winners next time around will be Indigenous disadvantage. So it's obvious that if someone can identify a problem in society, health, education, climate change, Indigenous disadvantage, What's the answer that politically is put back on the people? Love to help, not enough money. So why don't you all go work harder? Why don't you all go earn more money? Why don't we have to earn a lot more income tax and maybe then we can get around to tackling those problems? 
So it turns out that the reason we haven't tackled Indigenous disadvantage is it's your fault. You haven't worked hard enough yet. You haven't paid enough taxes yet. Sure, sure, there's the small issue of... Oh, I was sure I turned that off. <laughs> I really was. When I used to teach, that was more embarrassing. <laughs> it's the second cheapest Nokia you can buy. Um, it doesn't have a video camera, I don't think, but the one that didn't have a camera, the buttons were so crap uh, that you couldn't use it. So. <laughs> Someone asked, does it have a video camera? That's why I explained. Um, and it's a Nokia because I only know how to drive one set of menus and I gave up learning new things years ago. Um, <laughs> so, uh, in, no heckling. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so, sorry about the phone, I do apologise. Uh, so, uh, point being, we've constructed a, a national narrative where if you can identify a problem, if you can identify someone who's missing out, the answer is not to take resources away from something you need less of, it's to say, yeah, you're right, that's a problem, we need to have a lot more resources, so why don't you go work longer and harder? Now, again, that's fine. If that's the society we want to have, okay, but we need to diagnose it accurately. The third thing I want to talk about is, is trade, and by trade I mean trade between countries. Because while there's certainly uh, substantial inequity and disadvantage in Australia, the fact is, on average, Australians do much better than most people in the world. Now, averages are very dangerous things, you have to be very careful here. On average, Australians have less than two legs. <laughs> True story. <laughs> what? Less than two legs. Number of one-legged people, far lower than number of three-legged people. <laughs> okay? Average Australian has less than two legs. Point being, using something like average, say, well, the average income of an Australian is this, the average uh, amount spent on health is that, can be really dangerous. But when we compare countries, as we need to do, averages certainly tell us part of a story. And on average, Australians do much better than most people in the world. All right, we live in the richest point in human history, and we live in one of the richest countries in the world at the richest point in human history. So again, yes, there's substantial disadvantage in Australia that we continue to ignore, but overall we're doing okay. So when we cast our eyes abroad and think about disadvantage overseas, there are different ways that we can try and overcome that disadvantage. Uh, one of them is to do something like, great plug if you're in the room here, Danny, join Engineers Without Borders, um, and literally go overseas and try and help someone, actually build something for them, help them in a direct way. We can donate money rather than our skills and our time, there are all sorts of things that we can do either as individual or the Australian government can have aid projects. But the main way, the main way that countries like Australia look to countries that have far less than us, the main way that we propose to tackle inequity is through trade. So remember I said before when we identify in Australia, oh there's a problem, you're not happy with a particular outcome, why don't you go work harder and make some more stuff? Guess what we do when we go overseas and we find disadvantage and you know, grinding poverty in another country? We say, oh, OK, I can see that your country is really poor. I can see that your infant mortality rate is really high. I can see that you've got malnutrition. I can see that you've got fundamental problem providing health infrastructure to people. What you need to do is work harder and make stuff and sell it to me. And then I'll give you some money and then you can go and take that money and spend it on the poorest people in your community and solve their problems. Now don't get me wrong, trade I think is actually very useful and very handy. And done well, there's no doubt I think that it can, here's the important word, can lead to a substantial improvement in the quality of life of people, can. But just like doubling GDP can give us the resources to help indigenous disadvantage in Australia, it can do it, funnily enough it just hasn't, international trade can 
give us the capacity and give people in developing countries the capacity to deal with their disadvantage, but just because it can doesn't mean it will. <coughs> just because something's possible doesn't mean it, it's inevitable or even likely. So unfortunately, and I'm an economist, but uh, so I sort of, you know, carry, <coughs> carry the shame of my profession on my shoulders. But, you know, as a rule, economists don't worry too much about the difference between can and will. So economists typically look at situations and say, well, trade could help development in developing countries. So there you go, that'll do. Now, again, there's no doubt you can look around the world and you can find countries and you can find industries within countries where trade has led to substantial improvements in their quality of life. But at the same time, you can look around the world and you can find obvious, overt cases where appalling outcomes have occurred. And by appalling, you know, you can talk about human rights, or you can talk about environment, but I'm just going to talk about some appalling economic uh, outcomes. So I'll give you a simple example. Throughout the 1980s, the World Bank and organisations like that would run around the world saying to developing countries, look, we'd love to help, but we're not just going to give you money because you're dirt poor and we're filthy rich. How would that help? Um, what we'd like to do is encourage you to, you know, pick yourself up by your own bootstraps and, and make stuff and trade with us. So we'd, rather, we'd like you guys to move away from a, a, a subsistence type agricultural system. And by subsistence, I don't just necessarily mean subsistence within the household, but, you know, localised agricultural food production and localised trade. Why don't you guys start getting into big widespread cash crop growing. So you grow something, say like bananas or coffee or cocoa that we in the West would like to buy from you. So you stop making the diverse range of things you make and you make a lot of bananas or a lot of cocoa or a lot of coffee and then we'll buy the coffee off you and then you'll have lots of money and you can go buy all the stuff you want. Now this can work. This can be a really good idea. But unfortunately, the World Bank ran around and gave this same advice to a whole bunch of countries simultaneously. What do you think the unintended consequence of all those countries following that advice was? Really cheap bananas, really cheap cocoa, and really cheap coffee. Whoops. Sorry, poorest people in the world. Thanks for following our advice. Thanks for moving away from localised sustainable subsistence agriculture and into a cash crop that you can now provide to the world market. Problem is everyone's doing it. The world market for your product has collapsed because the price is set by the interaction between supply and demand and because we told everybody to increase their supply, we didn't forecast a reduction in the price. Whoops, my bad. Um, so, you know, we wind up with situations where people have moved away from admittedly agricultural systems that were never going to make them rich but at least kept them fed and moved them into situations where they now work very hard for very low wages to make stuff that we get to buy off them at very low prices. So hopefully for my sake you can see there's a bit of a link between what I just described in terms of what happens in developing countries, people chasing their tails working really hard to make stuff and no one in this room, but we perhaps know someone like our brother-in-law or something who works really hard here chasing their tail and not quite getting ahead. Now, sure, don't get me wrong, I would much rather chase my tail in Australia and waste a hell of a lot of time and worry about whether my MP7 was up to date or not. That's a much better problem to have than the problem that many people in developing countries have. But the problems aren't that dissimilar. The problems are that as a society, both Western society and increasingly, we're exporting this idea that what we all need is lots more stuff. And the only way to get lots more stuff is to work really hard. And the problem that we face is that when we get more and more people working harder and harder to make more and more stuff, you get yourself a lot of climate change. It's virtually impossible to have that many people making that much stuff and then moving all that stuff all around the world 
and in any meaningful way talk about sustainability and in any meaningful way talk about transitioning to a low carbon economy. Because in Australia when we talk about climate change we only talk about swapping coal fired power stations for wind turbines. Don't get me wrong, great idea, should see a lot more of it. But that is not transforming the economy, that's transforming the energy supply. The irony is we were transforming the economy throughout the 20th century. We were transforming the economy away from people who had few options except to die young and exhausted, literally, not exaggerating. We transformed the economy throughout the 20th century away from that and towards an economy where by the early 1970s people were working 35 hours a week for the first time in human history. They had four weeks of holidays a year and they took them. Okay, and because they hadn't heard of most of the things that we now need, they didn't actually suffer from anxiety due to the lack of them. Okay, so we've got really good at creating more and more needs, not even sure what the word means anymore, uh, and in such a way that we get to keep chasing our tail. Now, I'm not, again, sorry to sound defensive, I, I don't resile from anything I'm saying, but I just really want to stress, I don't care what you buy. I don't care how many hours individuals work. There are just consequences when 20 million people get together and make certain sets of decisions. And when you do a survey and you ask people, would you prefer a 4% pay rise or an extra two weeks paid holidays each year? 50% of people say I'd rather have an extra two weeks paid holidays each year. And by the way, they cost about the same amount. Next time you get a CPI adjustment at work, 4% could buy you a 50% holiday rise. Who in here gets six weeks holidays a year? Well done. That's incredibly disproportionate. Uh, across Australia, it's around 1% of people. <coughs> what would happen if you did that two years in a row? Well, your income would be exactly the same as it is now. You'd have eight weeks holidays a year. That's transforming the economy. Because rather than getting caught up in what we need is more stuff, and the only way to get more stuff is to get more money, the only way to get more money is to work hard, and unfortunately when I'm doing that, I create a huge amount of CO2. If we stay in that frame of reference, and do you, you know, God forbid the Chinese, the Indians and the rest of the developing world follow our lead, don't blame them for it. We're showing them how to do this. All right, if a couple of billion people want to play the way we're playing, then all the science is pretty, uh, pretty consistent as to what outcomes we'd expect. So sure, we need to uh, get low carbon sources of energy and sure, trade between countries uh, can help, I mean that, it really can help to improve everybody's quality of life, including people in developing countries, but it's not obvious that just because we get some wind turbines and just because we get some trade that we're going to tackle anything, be it indigenous disadvantage in Australia, inequities between countries and grinding poverty, and the total amount of CO2 that we put up into the atmosphere. So while as engineers I encourage you to keep working on the engineering solution to specific problems, I guess my contention is if all we do is look at the particular problems and we don't step back and ask what the hell are we doing, then we're going to be in a lot of trouble. Thank you.